Hi, my name is Jeff Beckham, and I'm a, I guess, a, a photographer, architect, painter, author. I've had a lot of different directions I've taken in my life, but it's all a very logical progression from where I was born until today. I was born and grow, uh, grew up in, outside of a little town in rural Indiana, surrounded by cornfields and, and flat land. It was a place that didn't have any working artists or uh, bookstores or uh, really any much in the way of highfalutin culture. I began to paint from an early age, kind of for no particular reason. It just seemed to come to me. I had a, a teacher in the second grade that let me get out of playing the sweet potato whistle by doing drawings, and it took. And I, uh, I just continued to do that and, and uh, really felt fulfilled with doing that. But there really weren't any people who could act as role models in this area. And so when I graduated from, from high school, I needed to be, find some way of making a living, but hopefully I could still combine that with my interest in fine art. But in, in order to do that, I basically had to find some direction that would assure my parents that I wouldn't end up starving in a, in a garret somewhere. And so I I went through architectural school at the University of Cincinnati, which is a program where you, you work hard, half the time in architectural offices and go to school the other half of the time. And you do that for six straight years. There are no vacations. It's just straight. You start off doing, and I certainly did, doing very silly things for architectural offices, thousands of toilet partitions for hospitals. And eventually, I worked my way through a series of offices until I was working as a designer for a very high, high quality office in, in the Midwest. But the one thing that really bothered me about being in that profession and being in the Midwest especially was, well, first of all, I couldn't stand cold weather. And I couldn't stand the weather in that area. I grew up there, but I still didn't like it. The last year I was in school, in college, which was 1977, it rained for 90 days straight. And I said, that's it, I'm leaving. And so, I moved to the West Coast to practice architecture. I figured that was something that I could, I could handle. Didn't know anybody out here. But I moved to San Francisco, got an apartment in, on the corner of Haight and Ashbury. And it was, uh, it was heaven. There was no snow. I worked in an office. I knew what I was getting into. The thing is, I'd already worked for six years in architectural offices. And so I knew what I was getting into. It's a, it's a field full of compromises. And I really didn't want to be in just compromising constantly. Too many people in the process. And so I decided when I got too frustrated with architecture, because I was working as a head designer in an architectural firm in San Francisco, I decided that what I would do is go and fill in the gaps in my architectural education, because the school I went to, the University of Cincinnati, they were based on the Bauhaus, and what it is is you ignore everything before the modern era in terms of your architectural history. And so I wanted to go and fill in architectural history. And so what I did is they were paying me oodles of money and I wasn't even aware of how to spend it. So I had saved enough that I felt I could live for quite a while without working again. So I went off to Europe and decided I would study Gothic cathedrals. It seemed like a good idea to me. So I went first to France and lived in Chartres and Amiens and Reims for several months in each place and met and worked with the architectural historians there. But you know, I never felt all that comfortable with architectural monuments. That's not the area I'm from. I'm a small town kid. And so when the weather got cold in France, I moved on down south and found my real calling in little rural villages in Italy and Spain and Portugal and places such as that. Those places really attracted me. I felt comfortable. I could communicate easily, even if I didn't speak the language well, with farmers and fishermen in these places. The other thing that happened at the same time, shortly after I moved to California, I met my, my wife, my future wife, uh, Sally Aberg, whose background in art history and journalism kind of filled in the gaps for me. Her real interest was in color painters. She, her background was, her, her real focus toward, toward the last of her schooling was in the Thalvis school, the French uh, ultra colorists. And 
that really influenced me as well. And so I became more and more interested in color. And by about 1981, I was totally focused on a combination of painting and architecture and how those combine and how that came to be, especially in small rural villages, in vernacular architecture. Why did people paint their houses? And how did those colors come to have meaning? And so that's what happened. Every year, I found out I was selling enough of my little paintings that I started out doing painting, little tiny paintings on site of Gothic cathedrals and eventually little houses and villages. And those paintings I sold through a little gallery in San Francisco, and they sold very well. And it gave me enough money and confidence to just continue to do that. Eventually, it just coalesced into a very clear direction for my artwork. And that eventually led to 12 years of just constantly returning to the Mediterranean, where I was originally only doing paintings. There were a style I developed of my own, which was a watercolor photorealist style that was dry brushed. I could work quickly, then continue to move on. Fairly quickly, I realized I wanted to do larger paintings, ones that were more complicated. And that meant that I was taking photographs to use as the basis for the paintings. And then eventually I realized, why am I translating these photographs into paintings? Because everything I wanted to say was in the photographs. And, and so what I started to do was print those photographs fairly early on. And slowly, the photography overtook the painting. What happened during that time as well is I realized that there was such a tradition of photography in the Monterey Peninsula. And I had a gallery who I really respected eventually down here, the Weston Gallery, who I'm still with, that was a part of that tradition. And I, want, I realized I wanted to have a gallery that represented me. I wanted to live near one of those galleries so I could have a close tie and, and have some interaction. I have galleries across the country that handle my work, but it was really nice to be able to live and talk to the people near, near one of them. And that was uh, what really brought me here was really Edward Weston, who's one of my heroes, was, uh, was based here. And I liked his concept of it wasn't all about equipment and, and chemistry. It was all about the way you see. He had a dark room, which was basically a closet with a bare light bulb in it. And that was his, his dark room. And I really respected that and liked that kind of approach to photography. And so coming down here brought me closer to that, brought me closer to nature and, and a, a calmer lifestyle which allowed me to contemplate what I was doing more. When I was living in Berkeley in the Bay Area, it's so dense, lines are so long, that I was, found myself, instead of enjoying the cultural aspects of it or the opportunities, I found myself fighting the, the density. And so it was wonderful to move down to, uh, to our house in Pacific Grove where I could really just, when I wasn't traveling, really kind of relax in a beautiful environment. And so it worked out extremely well. And that's where we still are. My wife and I are still, still right in the same neighborhood in Pacific Grove. And so after working for 12 years in the Mediterranean, one of the things that was really wonderful was the way in which photography and the actual experience of travel and looking closely at these places allowed me to see what people were doing with color, how they were using it in ways that I never as a painter would have thought to put colors together in way, the way in which they were doing that. I think the first trip I made to North Africa and to deep into Morocco was just a revelation that you could take these houses that were really just mud huts and turn them into these magnificent compositions just through the use of simple paint. That led me to both experimenting with painting and also the painting pushed me further into looking closer at the way in which people use color and then starting to do more and more anthropological research into why color was used, what color meant in ancient times and how that translated to today. And eventually, that led to a book that was produced with Sally and I doing the writing and it was published by a New York art house called Abbeville Press. It was very, very well received and I think we're in the seventh printing now. Uh, very large printings, and that really opened up a big door for me, which was the PBS asked me to do a documentary where they followed me around uh, basically Italy. Uh, they told me, where would you like to go? What's your favorite place? We started in the north and went through the south, through some of my favorite villages, and I, 
I talked about what attracted me and I would interview people about why they were doing what they were doing and what that was was kind of the culmination of my Mediterranean work. The European Union had kind of come together, the Euro was being brought about and things were changing very rapidly and I actually didn't want to see it. I decided it was, it was time to get out. I went to look for a new place that was, that was closer to home but still reasonably priced because when I travel I'm gone usually between four and six months at a time and I am constantly moving, constantly looking, constantly, constantly interviewing people and I can't afford to live in really expensive places and uh, live at a high level but the life I've chosen allows me to really uh, uh, do what I really want to do, follow my passions, make decisions as to what I want to do and just go for it as long as it interests me I can continue. And it took a little while to figure out where I was really interested. I started visiting uh, the, the Caribbean first and went down into northern Mexico and various places along the west coast of Mexico. But when I was traveling, I wasn't finding exactly either a combination of culture or of color that really interested me. And it wasn't until I was in the state of Veracruz, and little, little hill villages there, suddenly there were questions I couldn't answer and no one else could answer either. I go to the cemeteries and whereas in a lot of places the cemeteries are just like ours, you know, stones and painted white and crumbly. And then suddenly in Veracruz there were these richly painted cemeteries, even if the town itself had no color at all. And nobody could tell me why. It was always uh, es costumbre. It's the custom. We always do that. And it led me further into areas where the Maya were really the historic people of the area for 3,500 years, the, the Maya really had been the main people. And so Sally and I went and visited these areas and started to really get involved in trying to dig into the pre-Hispanic traditions and understand why people were painting things like their insides and outsides of their churches and the cemeteries, but they wouldn't paint their homes, for instance, or why everyone dressed exactly the same. And even if they had more money, they didn't show it. Uh, there were a lot of things that it took a long time to kind of get into and understand and it was an absolutely fascinating journey which eventually led to the publication of our second book that Sally and I wrote on the Maya called Maya Color. It opened another, another series of doors to me and I've continued to travel to Latin America to study the, the various cultures of Mexico and Central America. In the early 2000s, I, I ended up going down to uh, South America, living most of uh, three years down in uh, Peru and really trying to understand the Inca and pre-Inca civilizations there and photograph. And, and that's kind of where I'm still working as I've just spent most of 2011 in, in Ecuador. And there's plenty more to see there. But I just feel I'm just starting to scratch the surface of that area. In between the journeys of Central America and Mexico and South America, I, I did take uh, an extended trip into India, but as is normal, it, I don't move quickly when I get into an area. It takes too long for me to start to get a grasp of how a culture works. India is so rich in cultures, religions, and traditions, and uh, it's so different from any other place I was that I only managed to hit one small area of India in five months, but uh, I've got plenty more to see there, but I have photographed, and that's the one of the most recent, I think that is the most recent body of work that I have presented to the public. At the same time that I'm doing the, the photography, I always return to painting because I find that the two help me kind of progress. Each one adds to the, the other. So I'll return to watercolor painting, but more recently I've been doing paintings in oil and wax, first on wood panel that were architecturally related. And then in the, for the last 10 years, I've been doing uh, plein air paintings on uh, the central coast of, uh, mostly in the Big Sur area, where um, it's just so wonderful to get out in nature. And instead of having to find the color as it exists, because I don't really change it, I consider the phot photographs I take documentary. I'm not changing anything. I do very little manipulation in terms of, I, I'll do dodging and burning. Rarely do I even crop a photograph. I, it's all done in camera. It's very straightforward. But in painting, I can actually see what's there and maybe interpret using that same color sense what it could be if I really think of the shadows as not gray but purple or, or blue or the, the sky is not pale blue or white but maybe that gold that I'm seeing just 
in a bare, in a bare a bit of the, of the composition. So I'm actually often just accentuating things that I'm really seeing, but it allows me to really experiment with color in a way that photography doesn't, and I really enjoy that. And so I'll be continuing to do, do that into the future. Another of the shows that I've done recently, which really is important to me, is the Father Sarah missions. I, I, of course, have been uh, well aware of Father Sarah and his history of founding the cities of California. But when I was in central Mexico, I discovered that there was a, a series of missions that Father Sarah founded and, and expanded upon in central Mexico in the state of Querétaro that were fantastic, completely unlike the California missions, much more elaborate. 3D sculpture of martyred saints and angels and indigenous plants and animals that were totally unlike what we have here. And not only that, but they were brightly painted. So I studied them and tried to interpret the way in which the, the Spanish came and had the indigenous people uh, build these and they interpreted the Catholic religion in terms of what they understood. And so they're a combination of their syncretic uh, religious expressions and that's really wonderful. So I photographed the Father Sarah missions in Mexico back in, uh, I think it was 1999, I made two trips down to this rather remote area of central Mexico. And these were missions that he had built under his supervision before he came to California. And so they're the precedents for California missions. As a matter of fact, there are a number of layout issues that he worked on while he was down in Mexico. For instance, the Carmel mission is very, very similar in, the, in its layout, in its orientation, to the mission of Halpan, which was his home mission in Querétaro State. And it was just fascinating to see the differences that were there and how rich that, uh, that tradition was there. But after I photographed them, the Mexican government, in its wisdom, decided to put bird netting over all of the facades of all of the buildings there. So I was happy that I was able to photograph them before that was done. So I got some of the last carefully taken photographs of these uh, five missions that he built in this one little area. And now they'll never be available for people to see clearly again because they're just always covered with netting or scaffolding to keep them uh, clear of the birds. I printed those photographs and they were shown for an extended period of time at the Carmel Mission and several other missions throughout California. And that, uh, that show is continuing to travel and it's in various missions around California. And at the same time, I've, that, that made me become much more interested in the California missions. And so I've begun to photograph the treasures that we have here in California. And I was uh, brought in to photograph a number of the treasures in uh, the San Miguel, Miguel Mission down a little south in, in Monterey uh, County. And uh, those have been published several times. And uh, I think there's just, just a fantastic amount of information that even though they've been studied for years, isn't really all that well known. And so uh, this has given me a great opportunity to do that. What I learned about color over the years is that color is the one thing that people can afford to do in these poor little places to turn something from a, uh, an an old, decrepit place into something monumental, in effect. And that these people who most people here would consider primitive are actually extremely adept at, uh, at the use of color because it's extremely important to them. And so I've taken that in my own work and uh, I, I, I hope that the work that I do in, in, throughout the world is, is really a celebration of these people and to show that uh, we, as, as Americans who think of ourselves as the high point in civilization, really can learn a lot from these, these people in these places that have not, never left town, basically. They still know a lot that we can learn from them. And, and then also, uh, just here, I've, I've been working with my friend Lucas Block, who I've, uh, I've shown with many times. He's an abstract colorist painter. And we've been doing recently uh, color consulting on people's houses. Uh, just because it's a way and for, for us to be able to enliven our own environment. And so there's a number of homes we've done in the Monterey Peninsula, which, uh, which you can't miss them, usually. They're, uh, they're brilliantly colored, and they really do stand out from their neighbors. But uh, that's been really, very well received. One of the joys of living here is to, to walk outside my door and look at Monterey Bay and the richness of color all around us. And the, the rich history of painting and photography here is something that, uh, that exists very few other places in the world. 
it's, it's absolutely incredible and something not to be missed. And so I hope everyone that, that comes down here takes advantage of the, the history and the current traditions of, of art in, on the Monterey Peninsula.